One of the most significant architectural icons in this country is the glass Farnsworth House outside Chicago. Designed by Mies van der Rohe in the 1940s, it was a marvel from the day its first resident, Edith Farnsworth, moved in. But as the Boston Globe columnist Alex Beam writes in his new book, Broken Glass, the modernist masterpiece became a monster. Alex Beam, author of Broken Glass, thank you so much for joining us. Jared, it's nice to see you. Thank you very much. So for people who aren't familiar with the Farnsworth House, how do you describe where it stands in the, literally stands, I guess, too, in the, in the canon of American architecture? Uh, it's probably the best regarded, the most highly regarded example of modernist residential architecture of the 20th century. It's easiest to understand in the context of the better known Glass House, uh, which is a copy of the Farnsworth House in New Canaan, Connecticut. Here in your book, you tell this story of these two figures who come together, very maverick, very independent. Tell us who Mies van der Rohe and Edith, Dr. Edith Farnsworth were when they met. Right. They met um, during the last, uh, last year of the war in Chicago on the Gold Coast. Mies van der Rohe, it's hard to, it, it's not hard, but it's complicated who he was in 1945. He, he was probably... Um, with, say, Le Corbusier, the most highly regarded European architect of that time. He fled Nazism because basically Hitler didn't like his architecture, um, and Mies just wanted to build. And f f chance uh, threw him together with this sort of 41-year-old, uh, like, a, you know, doctor, Dr. Edith Farnsworth. Edith was a, a handsome, intelligent lady. Anyway, they're having this ridiculous dinner party. And she says, I got this nice riverside property. Would you build me a house there? And Mies, again, this comes out in the book, Mies is very sort of chivalrous, very old school, very attracted to women. And so for some reason, uh, he, he says yes, you know, whether he's hoping to get a nice dinner out of it or whatever. In any case, he says yes. Well, that becomes the question here. She wanted a weekend house in this nine acre bucolic space that you just described but he is one of the world's preeminent architects. So did they really have the same mission at the outset? She, she was interested in Mies in, in every sense of the word. And uh, uh, an academic has said that she was really more of a patron in this relationship of Mies than a client. Now that becomes very blurred as the story progresses, but it's become clear to me that Mies, uh, buoyed, buoyed by her intelligence and her interest in very arcane philosophical subjects, says, I'm going to build, I'm going to build the platonic idea of a perfect, uh, summer house in, you know, a perfect villa, a perfect modernist mid 20th century villa. He constructs a residence exclusively made of pain glass and beautiful white steel girders. I think, in a way, he, he created a beautiful work, a transcendent work of, of residential sculpture um, and felt that because of his warm, excellent relations with the client, that he could do that and that she was enough of an art aficionado to be comfortable with that. You paint these great descriptions of how hot it was in the summertime, how cold it was in the wintertime, what it was like to squeegee all those windows, the fact that it was so close to being flooded virtually all of the time, being right there on the river, um, let alone the fact that there were leaks and other things. And you start to wonder, yes, he had wonderful concepts, but did he know what he was doing necessarily there? Well, it's hard to say. He, he, you know, he was not a noted designer of residences. He designed only one other in the United States. His associate, who was responsible for its construction, you know, rather sheepishly admitted like 30 years later, you know, I wish I had known about roof flashing or something. I mean, it's, it's nuts, of course, that, um, that a top level architect wouldn't know uh, the, the correct materials to use at the edge of a roof. I mean, you know, in this case, the, the worst case scenario comes to pass and that eventually there's litigation about the house and its many shortcomings are broadcast to the world. Well, that becomes a, a great drama as you have access to these, these trial transcripts and what happened. But how, 
they had such a good relationship at the outset. As you mentioned, she probably wanted to be a patron. It seems that there was a romantic relationship. And then how epically did it explode as it went to trial? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, the trial is like a divorce trial. This crazy, crazy lawsuit that Meese actually filed to get, I guess, six or $7,000, um, you know, created this 4,000-page transcript of utter vitriol um, from both sides. As you can see in the book, you know, Edith's lawyers deliberately humiliate Meese. They make fun of his uh, inability to speak very coherent English. And they're very depreciative, shall we say, of his, you know, the fact that he didn't put air conditioning in there, the fact he didn't use thermal pane glass. And they kind of put him, they, they kind of put him on trial as a European esthete who basically doesn't know anything about plumbing. We all know on the East Coast, the glass house that Philip Johnson did that is now iconic that people can visit just as they can the Farnsworth house. But was there just out and out plagiarism there by Philip Johnson when he created his house? Uh, that's a complicated question. Um, Johnson and Meese had a you know, mentor-mentee relationship, very, very weird relationship that lasted uh, all of Philip Johnson's life. Um, the short answer is, it, in fact, it is a copy. On the other hand, Meese was never angry that Johnson had copied it. Having said that, I mean, uh, Johnson did literally take the plans off of Meese's desk and build <laughs> it before the Farnsworth House was built, about three years before. Take us through what it's like to be at the house. Well, it is, you know, they, they do yoga there. I mean, it's a pretty meditative space, right? And I, it's funny, uh, my book wasn't particularly heavily edited, but I think I included somewhere the fact that I, I would live in that house. Um, you know, it, the, the operative phrase for me is, you know, we will let the outside in. He wanted to celebrate nature, really, the river in front um, the meadow behind, trees all around. I find it striking, and I think most people um, find it kind of ethereal. It's really a beautiful work of art. Well, Alex Beam, thank you so much for being with us. It was such a great work of art about a work of art. Thank you. Hey, Jared, thank you for taking the interest. I very much appreciate it. 